Good evening, everybody. Welcome. My name is Rowan Newfeld, events coordinator for McNally Robinson Booksellers in Saskatoon. Um, from this end, we're on the traditional lands of the Plains, uh, Plains Cree, Soto, Dene, Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota. We are also streaming from the homeland of the Métis Nation. So I'd like to welcome you all to the launch of the Saskatoon History Review number 31. Thanks so much to the Saskatoon Heritage Society for working with us on tonight's event. We're joined by contributors uh, Peggy Sargent, Ryan Walker, Bonnie Dahl, William P. Delaney, Diane Wilson, and Jeff O'Brien. And Jeff O'Brien is also doing double duty as our host for the evening. So I'll introduce him shortly here. Um, before I pass things along, I have a couple of brief Zoom housekeeping items. We've enabled live auto captions tonight, which you can access by clicking the live transcript button along the bottom of your screen. We'll also have some time for questions later in the evening. If you're comfortable using the Q&A box uh, to type in your questions, please do so. Um, if you don't uh, raise your hand or use the raise hand function, and we will try to allow you to share your question via audio. Um, so we may not have time to get to everyone, but I will leave that up to our host, Jeff O'Brien. Just before I introduce him, I think, um, We'd like to invite all of the contributors uh, to turn their videos on and just wave hello so you can kind of get the community feel that we would have if we were doing this in person. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Back all <in> right. <laughs> okay, I am going to introduce our host for tonight. Jeff O'Brien was born in Saskatoon and raised in Regina, where <laughs> Despite his best efforts to the contrary, he received an undergraduate degree in Canadian history. He went on to earn a master's degree in archival studies from the University of British Columbia before returning home to Saskatchewan, where he eventually settled down uh, as the city of Saskatoon archivist in 1997. And as the city archivist, Jeff believes in bringing history out of the archives and into the community. He's written extensively about Saskatoon, including uh, co-authoring the book, Saskatoon History and Photographs. He's a regular speaker in city classrooms, at local events, and uh, to community groups. And you can also uh, often see him on radio and TV talking about the history of his beloved adopted city. So we're pleased to have him here tonight uh, to host this launch. Please welcome Jeff O'Brien. Jeff, you're uh, muted there. I'll just get you to unmute. You know, I've done these before. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name, as noted, is Jeff O'Brien. I'm the City of Saskatoon Archivist. It's my great pleasure to be your host this evening for the launch of Volume 31 of the Saskatoon History Review. So the, his the, the, uh, the Saskatoon History Review is published by the Saskatoon Heritage Society. The very first issue hit the newsstands in 1980. There were further issues published in 1981 and in 1985. And then in 1988, the late Bill Sargent uh, went to the Heritage Society and he proposed that henceforth it be published annually with himself as editor. And the rest, as they say, is history. The review is a labor of love and it shows. And it's also an immense amount of work. And we have Peggy Sargent and Linda Dietz to thank for it. And I want to especially point out the production quality of the current issue, which is largely due to Linda, who's responsible for the layout and who does a tremendous job of the final editing. So this issue could not have been published without her. So Linda, if you could take a moment, join the rest of us in patting you on the back. That would be entirely deserved. The review could not publish without you. Thank you very much. The Saskatoon History Review is a very rare bird here in Canada, so I asked around. In all of Canada, there are only a handful of historical journals like this one, specifically focused on a single municipality. And since the Provincial Archives stopped publishing Saskatchewan history a couple years ago, it's the only historical journal in the province, and that makes it a considerable accomplishment and one of which we should be proud. 
If you go through a list of articles published in the review over the years, it's like reading a who's who of Saskatoon history. We have a very robust local history community here, and it's in a large part because of the encouragement and the support provided by Saskatoon History Review over the last 40 years. So this issue features the work of six local authors. We have Ryan Walker, writing about the Peggy McCurcher conservation area from ancient times to the present. Bonnie Dahl, who mixes the personal and the historical in her piece on the Saskatoon office of the Provincial Archives. Bill Delaney's excellent article on Robert Caswell's land deals during Saskatoon's great real estate boom. Diane Wilson, who takes us with her on a hunt for the 1883 Charles Garrison House. And Peggy Sargent herself with a biography of the late and beloved Don Kerr, who edited Saskatoon history from 2003 until his death last year. And there's also a little something from me about Saskatoon's boom era factoria development. But our first speaker tonight is Peggy Sargent. Peggy's been involved in Saskatoon's heritage community since 1972 when she arrived here from Britain with her late husband Bill and their young family. She was a founding member of the Saskatoon Heritage Society and has served on the Society Board for many years, currently in the role of President. She also serves on the board of the Friends of the Forestry Farmhouse and is a past member of the Gustin Trounce Heritage Committee. She's received several awards for her uh, heritage work, including the Lieutenant Governor's Award of the Heritage Canada Foundation and the Miwasan Conservation Award. She is, in fact, the very face of local history in Saskatoon. Her biography of the late Don Kerr is, by my count, the 11th time her writing has graced the pages of Saskatoon History Review. Take it away, Peggy. Okay, now I need to do the full, ah, there we are. Good evening, everybody. Uh, this is a real pleasure for me to be here to talk about uh, Don Kerr with you this evening. It's about a year ago now, sadly, on the 8th of December uh, of last year, uh, we said a final goodbye to Donald Cameron Kerr. Many of you will know Don as that man with the big personality who enjoyed a good scotch, uh, who loved art and literature and jazz, who imbued his students at the university with his own love of films. And he spent time talking uh, over uh, with his um, colleagues over lunch at the faculty club. I'm quite sure there were some huge discussions that went on there. You may also know uh, Don for his literary achievements, in particular, his prolific poetic output, which led to his appointment as Provincial Poet Laureate. But there's another aspect to Don's life, which we don't hear quite so much about, that's his work within Saskatoon's heritage community and the important influence he has had on the city's views of heritage preservation. In this tribute to Don, I've tried to fill in the background to his heritage work and to record some of his achievements. He is remembered as the driving force behind the uh, formation of the Saskatoon Heritage Society and he served as the society's founding president. He was the chair of the first chair of the Municipal Heritage Advisory Committee, and he edited this journal for 16 years from 2003 to 2019. This particular issue is dedicated to remembering Don. He also co-authored with Stan Hansen what is now recognized as the standard work on Saskatoon's early history. Saskatoon, the first half century. Don's connection to the built fabric of Saskatoon and especially to his new Tanner neighborhood ran deep. We see it in his advocacy work, but it spilled over all the time into his poetry. I especially remember his bitter poem, Capital Punishment, which was written at the demolition, after the demolition of Saskatoon's beloved Capitol Theatre. It appeared in A New and Improved Sky. So if you haven't seen the book, 
here it is. This is the collection in which capital punishment appears. You all need to read the poem in full, but here's an extract from it, which I have included in my article. So here we go. Demolition began first thing in the morning before our eyes were open. In quiet corners of the city, slight tremors were recorded. My heart skipped a beat. An old house began to cough. A street looked round. Is there something missing? A faint dust rises from the, from the heart of downtown. The great lady has had her wrapper removed, her gown and her shoes and various antique undergarments. Shamelessly, the breakers peel skin. She exhales dust. A rib, is, a rib is removed. People have a look. A less well-known and unappreciated literary work is Don's essay called Ways of Seeing Saskatoon. This was published in Saskatoon Imagined Art and Architecture in the Wonder City. And not many people remember this. This was a publication uh, put out by the Mendel Art Gallery to commemorate a wonderful exhibition um, <coughs> entitled Saskatoon Imagined. For me, this essay encapsulates all his thoughts about the value of our built environment and the value of our neighborhoods. I included some of that in my article too, some of the uh, quote from that particular essay. And you can hear Don's voice as he talks about what he would like to see in a built city. I would say the fullest possible texture, the richest texture, like the neighborhood I grew up in, full of things, and in architectural terms, full of the styles that existed here, a kind of architectural memory of where we've been, examples of all the things that have made up the 100 years of Saskatoon. I hope that this article will shed a little life, light on the life of a big man. Thank you, Don. We miss you, but your legacy remains. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Peggy. <clears throat> Our next author is Ryan Walker. Ryan is a professor of geography and planning at the University of Saskatchewan and is the Associate Dean of the College of Graduate and Postdoctoral Studies. He was born in Winnipeg and grew up there and in Alberta and he did his MA at Waterloo and his PhD at Queen's and he's lived across Canada in Swaziland, Tanzania and New Zealand and he now calls Saskatoon home where he is a past board member for the Saskatoon Heritage Society and serves currently as vice chair of the Miwasan Valley Authority and I've had the pleasure of working with Ryan on a number of projects over the years and I'm going to say that we're very lucky to have him. Ryan's article is entitled The Rich and Textured Landscape of Peggy McKercher Conservation Area. Ladies and gentlemen, Ryan Walker. Thanks for that introduction, Jeff. Uh, made me cry. Um, it was uh, very nice. Uh, so <laughs> incidentally, when I moved to New Zealand, uh, one of the ways that I connected with uh, the new place where I was living and had really no grounding in was uh, by going to what would be the equivalent of their local history room at the public library and and learning more about the city I was living in and its heritage. And I've I've always found, at least since I've been an adult and, and engaging in, in my own independent research, that heritage sort of uh, grounds you either to the place where you're from or, or to places that you're visiting. And it in many ways feeds the soul. Uh, you know, a lot of the work that that you know many of us do is you know, it's important work, uh, sometimes very technical work, uh, and, um, but it doesn't always have the deep meaning that um, a good, you know, thorough engagement with history and heritage in the place where you live, uh, you know, really brings you. So I think Jeff's got a trained job uh, to be able to do that for a living. Uh, anyway, my, my article 
uh, talks about the Peggy McCurcher Conservation Area, and uh, and really what motivated me to write it was uh, I had joined the Miwasan Valley Authority Board a few years ago, and uh, I was interested in the sites that the Miwasan Valley Authority had within its conservation zone. And, you know, the Miwasan Valley, I'll just call it Miwasan, Miwasan doesn't own a lot of, of its sites. Uh, it's a steward uh, and uh, conservation and, and education, uh, managing development, uh, but doesn't necessarily own, you know, a, a lot of a lot of land, but it does own the Peggy McCurcher Conservation Area. And, and I found it intriguing and it's got a heck of a story to it. And when, you know, I started to dig down deeper into the layers of history there, I found that this landscape, which you can go and look at and, you know, get a, a, a general appreciation for has, you know, a lot of stories to tell. And so what my article does is it tells a few of those stories and, and you know, it really starts with a general, uh, a general discussion or mention of the, you know, thousands of years of Indigenous history, uh, First Nations and uh, Métis history in uh, the area that is now the 11 hectare area uh, called the Peggy McCurcher Conservation Area. And just to give you a sense of where that's located, if you're familiar with where the Northeast Swale is, we'll, we'll go north a little bit further and then go right over to the River Valley. And it's at the end of what is called the Small Swale. And it's got about a one kilometer uh, of beautiful river outlooks. And, and um, it was named after, the, after Me Wasson's first and longest serving board chair, Peggy McCurcher, who, uh, you know, served from 1979 to 1995. So the small swale landscape itself is, you know, at least it's, it's over 10,000 years old and it's still uh, a reasonably intact example of temperate grasslands, native temperate grasslands, which is the most uh, endangered ecosystem in the world. And so, I mean, if we start there and then uh, impose, superimpose on that um, the many Indigenous peoples' history that have uh, occupied that area and used that area and, and continue to do so. And then uh, also add on the, the settler history that uh, the Temperance Colonization Society, uh, you know, represented in the, in the 1880s and, and onward. Uh, the, the story of the site's quite fascinating. So I start with some of the, well, I basically um, explore some of the settler history, fo focusing a little bit on William Hutchins and his family, who in 1916 uh, occupied the site and, um, you know, received the patent for the land. And they lived there until uh, he passed away. And then his wife, Caroline, moved away shortly after. And, um, and, you know, fast forward to 1945 and a, a local lawyer, uh, Archie LaMarche, purchased the site from uh, the Hutchins estate. And so Archie LaMarche, if you're familiar with the uh, uh, McDermott LaMarche law firm, that's, uh, he's the LaMarche. Uh, so, but in 1930, when times were really tough in Saskatoon as, as, as across the prairies and, and and, and much of uh, you know, Canada at the time, uh, Archie LaMarche joined a law practice uh, here in Saskatoon. But he was a farm boy, had grown up a farm boy and was a farm boy at heart and wanted his, uh, his family and his kids in particular, son and daughters to enjoy some of that um, connection to the country. So he acquired this, uh, this parcel of property that's now the Peggy McCurcher Conservation Area built a log cabin on it with uh, a Scottish, a retired Scottish joiner friend of his. And, um, and I'll read you, and, and his kids grew up going out there and they, they um, affectionately called the, the, the place and the log cabin on it, the ranch. So um, Jack, his son, uh, records some recollections that Andrea Ziegler from uh, Miwasan shared with me in a letter uh, that he had, he had, uh, he had shared. 
Uh, he says, we kids came to love the ranch as my father did. The riverbank provided wonderful hideouts, trails, and play areas. We'd watch crows and magpies build their nests and raise their noisy youngsters the spring and summer and a prodigious riverbank spring was plumbed by my father with an old sunken barrel and stone sluiceways. In addition to providing a bountiful water supply, it attracted all kinds of birds and animals for us to observe. The river provided fishing for gold eye and periodically we'd see a giant sturgeon breaching midstream. In 1963, the LaMarche family sold the land to the Roman Catholic uh, Diocese or the Episcopal Corporation of Saskatoon uh, in 1963. And it was um, uh, the bishop at the time, Francis Klein, he had recovered from a, a heart attack the year before at St. Paul's Hospital and, and, and a, light, a light went off uh, that, um, you know, the sisters, uh, congregations of women religious in Saskatoon, who, although there were, were several congregations of women religious, they, were, they tended to be working um, on their own projects in, in relative isolation from one another. And, um, and the idea which, you know, he supported, but, you know, was reportedly also uh, brought forward by a, uh, one of his colleagues, the father, uh, John Robinson, um, they created this resort with the Sisters Superior uh, at, and they called it Maryville. And so there was a chapel on the site and this went on until 1995, there was a chapel on the site. They kept the log cabin that was the, 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 you know, the home on the LaMarche Ranch and turned it into their common lodge. They had a swimming pool, basketball courts, volleyball, um, uh, baseball, they had horses for a time and they had this uh, wonderful water spring, which, which, and, and then several other cabins where uh, different congregations of sisters uh, religious could, could, could go. And they, um, they had a water spring on the site, the same one that was referred to uh, earlier by, by, in Jack's recollections at the ranch. And interestingly, that water spring is one of the great sort of pieces that carries on the connection between different users of the site. Um, it was believed that a secondary trail from the Moose Woods to the Tosh Trail, uh, and that trail passed on the quarter section just to the east of the Peggy McCurcher Conservation Area. It, um, a trail from that main Moose Woods to the Tosh Trail went over to the water spring where people using the trail um, would be able to, to rest and water their animals. Uh, as the case may be. And then of course it was used as a water source at the ranch and then at Maryville as well. And, you know, there, it's a really magical story of, of how the, the sisters and, um, you know, worked together over decades to, to really enjoy and build a, sp a rich spiritual and experiential and natural connection at this site. And, it's really, it really is a magical story. And, and I think it's my favorite part of the story in the article. And, um, and then finally, you know, in, in um, 1995, the, the diocese uh, closed Maryville down and um, they held on to the land though for another 12 years. And then in 2007, uh, Watson acquired the land and it still remains closed to the public after, what is that? Oh, well, 2007 to 13, 14 years. And um, it still remains closed to the public, but when MVA required it, uh, acquired it, it was still 90% intact temperate grassland ecosystem. And there are plans to incorporate it into the trail network. And Miwasan has been using it for incidentally reconnecting with, with um, its earliest history and using it uh, in some cases as a site where uh, ceremony occurs and, um, and there's a reconnection to the, the most natural and uh, sort of fundamental aspects of that site. And some of that is discussed in the article. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ryan. Uh, and let's have our next speaker. And our next up is Bonnie Dahl. So Barney, Bonnie is a born and raised Saskatoon girl. 
and she has her master's degree in history from the University of Saskatchewan. She worked for 12 years as a reference archivist at the Provincial Archives of Saskatchewan's Saskatoon office, leaving that position when the office closed in 2018. She then had the good fortune to work at the University of Saskatchewan Archives and Special Collections before moving to her current position as an Access and Privacy Officer for the Saskatoon Police Service. Bonnie's drive, her passion, and her energy are apparent in everything she does, including in her article in this issue entitled A Scheme of Government University Cooperation, The History of the Saskatoon Office of the Provincial Archives of Saskatchewan. Bonnie, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so as Jeff mentioned, I worked at the Saskatoon Office of the Provincial Archives for 12 years. When the office closure was announced in 2018, one of the many things that bothered me about the closure was that the focus of the conversation at that time um, was entirely on the decision to close the office. Um, even once it was clear that the decision to close the office wasn't going to be reversed, the focus of the attention remained strictly on justifying that decision to close. And for me, I thought that was a bit of a shame um, because often when an important institution closes for whatever reason, there's an element of celebration and commemoration involved. Um, oftentimes there's an effort made to acknowledge and recognize the work and contributions of that institution as part of the closure. And that didn't happen in 2018 or even into 2019, and, and that really bothered me. Um, so when Archives Week rolled around in February of 2020, I decided to give a short presentation at our annual Archives Week reader event at the Roxy Theatre about the 74 year history of the Saskatoon office so that people would know about the important contributions that office has made to Saskatoon's heritage community and also to the provincial heritage community. Uh, later in the year, Peggy Sargent got in touch with me and she'd heard about the presentation and wondered if I'd write an article for the magazine and so here I am. Um, so I thought for tonight, um, I would read an excerpt from, the, from my article. Um, given that the that background that the purpose of my article was to remember that office and to celebrate uh, its contributions and recognize those contributions. I thought it would be appropriate to read about what I feel are two of the most important contributions that the Saskatoon office made to the Saskatoon heritage community that I think most people actually don't know about. Um, so this is the, the excerpt from the article. So another important role that the Saskatoon office played in the Saskatoon heritage community was in supporting the foundation of two significant Saskatoon heritage institutions. The first institution that the archives helped to found was the University of Saskatchewan Archives. In the 1950s, the university was becoming concerned about the lack of records management of its own records. Materials were being stored randomly around the campus and there was no consistent method of preserving records of historical value. In 1956, the University Council approved the establishment of a university archives that would be managed by the staff at the Provincial Archives. The Provincial Archives provided safe and centralized storage, organized the material, and made the records available to researchers. After several years of providing this service, the universities and the archives needs changed. In 1967, Douglas Bocking, who was head of the Saskatoon office, noted that the university's records would soon outgrow the storage space available in the provincial archives. He recommended that it was time for the university to develop staff and manage its own archival and records management program. In 1970, the university appointed its first university archivist. And when the new wing of the Murray building was complete in 1974, the records were removed from the provincial archives to the new University of Saskatchewan archives. The second institution that the Saskatoon office helped to create was the City of Saskatoon Archives. In the 1970s, the City of Saskatoon did not have a records management program and its historical records were stored haphazardly in poor conditions in the central stores and a number of other city buildings. The city began to explore its records management options. At the same time, the city was also receiving pressure from Don Kerr and Stan Hansen, who wanted to write a history of Saskatoon for its upcoming centennial, but were having difficulties accessing the city's historical records. 
1979, the city agreed to transfer some historical records temporarily to the Provincial Archives in Saskatoon so that Kerr and Hansen could access them for their history. After their project was finished, the city saw the benefit of having their historical records preserved, organized, and easily accessible. However, the cost of building a proper archival storage facility and obtaining trained staff was considered prohibitive for the city. The city concluded that the logical depository for its records was the provincial archives as, quote, the cost of manpower and equipment in operating a city archives cannot be justified as long as the provincial archives is equipped to provide the same service to the citizens of Saskatoon. So the city entered into an agreement with the Provincial Archives in 1985 to have the Saskatoon office manage the city's historical records. Over the years, as the needs of the city grew and the budget of the Provincial Archives shrank, it became time for the city to manage its own records. In 1992, the city removed its records and created the City of Saskatoon Archives. Both the University of Saskatchewan Archives and the City of Saskatoon Archives are now major repositories for historical records in Saskatoon. The guidance, encouragement, and support provided by the Saskatoon Office of the Provincial Archives gave both institutions a safe place to develop a solid foundation for their programs. That both institutions are still strong members of the archival and heritage community in Saskatoon today speaks to the importance of the work done by the Saskatoon Office to foster both programs. And that's all, thanks. Well, thank you very much, Bonnie. And you know, I'll tell you that there are those who will say that now that city has repatriated its records that they are once again being stored haphazardly and in poor condition. Um, uh, speaking as a city archivist, I'd like to say thank you to the Provincial Archives for the work that it did setting up our collection and, uh, and uh, showing us uh, guiding us on our way, as it were, and also for the uh, for the um, Star Phoenix photograph collection, which the City Archives acquired after the Saskatoon office of the Provincial Archives closed down, and which we love. Anyway, thank you very much for that uh, wonderful talk, Bonnie. And our next speaker is Bill Delaney. A former high school history teacher in Saskatoon, Bill followed up his teaching career by working for several years in the local history room at the Saskatoon Public Library. In 1982, he co-authored the book Saskatoon, A Century in Pictures with John Duercop and the late Bill Sargent. Before that, he and Bill Sargent collaborated on Saskatoon, The Growth of a City in 1974. And that book was based on Bill Delaney's MA thesis. And in my opinion, it is still, all these years later, the best introduction to Saskatoon's history available. The uh, Hanson and Kerr book, that's the academic one, that's the one with all the meat and the details, but if you want to, if you're new to Saskatoon like I was, and you want to know what makes it tick and how it all began, Bill Delaney's book, that's the one to read. Bill's previous articles in the review include one on the heritage preservation movement that is a must read for anyone doing architectural heritage in Saskatoon, and in 2006, I had the privilege of working with Bill and another local history room librarian, Ruth Miller, on the book Saskatoon A History and Photographs which was published for the 2006 centennial and I think that Ruth Miller might be on the call. Ruth if you're out there tonight, hi, how you doing? Bill's article in this issue is called Robert W. Caswell's Recollection of Boomtime Land Deals in Early Saskatoon. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Bill Delaney. Hello. You're good. Thanks. Technology isn't my field. Anyway, uh, I think what would be most valuable at this time uh, would be just a brief background to my uh, article in this particular issue. Um, so I'd like to give you a little bit on the situation in Saskatoon at that time and Robert Caswell. Saskatoon experienced a period of unprecedented growth from 1906 to 1912, during which its population increased fivefold. With this growth came unprecedented increase 
or an increase in the demand for surrounding farmland in which to locate the city's expanding functions. As a result, there was a in major increase in the value of the farmland and similar op or increases in the opportunities to profit from selling it. Now into this setting is Robert Caswell, who then farmed a half section on the northern margin of the city. He had homesteaded the east section, then purchased the uh, adjacent preempted west quarter, sorry, I should say uh, quarters, for a nominal fee in the 1890s. However, by 1906, his half section was being engulfed by the expansion of the growing city. Now, the, the specifics for this article that I incre uh, have put in or included in this article come essentially from, uh, I've got a photo here of it, but from his handwritten reminiscences, as he called them. In other words, a collection of, I don't know if you can see it here, but it's notebooks of his uh, recollections of things that he had done over the years. And I found this part particularly interesting was his land deals during that time. I've since placed these in the local history room. So if someone would like to have a look at them on their own, they're uh, quite welcome to do so there. Anyway, in this article, what I recount is, is his story of how he strategically bought an alternative half section of land directly north of the city. In other words, he knew what he was doing. Uh, there's often a story that, or it's often understood that a lot of the local land takers were rather naive and didn't follow uh, or weren't able to compete with the developers. But in his case, he'd strategically bought an alternative half section of land directly north of the city. Then after severing about 10 acres of it, which included his farm, farmstead, he sold the remainder to, of his original half to a local real estate firm. Uh, in the result, or you ended up with a net profit of $50,000, which would be about a million and a half in current dollars, as I understand it, yet kept his farm operation essentially in, uh, intact. Now, he does go on, though, to say that uh, when he did put his alternate half section eventually on the open market in 1910, he became involved with a couple of unscrupulous speculators. And before he was finished, he did have to resort to legal action and costs in getting these agreements uh, rescinded. It would be another three years before he was able to have the municipal tax assessment on one of these quarters readjusted to uh, correspond to the agricultural uses to which uh, he returned it. Uh, what I see as the value in this uh, in this article and it's, is it gives insight into the period of the time or into the times in which it, uh, it portrays. Robert's uh, land deals, but exemplify the many transactions between developers and property owners in Saskatoon during that time. And like some, like his, some of these deals resulted in windfall pro, uh, profits, others in significant losses. But it, it again, it represents a, a phenomena taking place at that time and uh, provides a case study that I think is interesting, uh, not only of the times, but of the man and the deals then taking place. Anyway, I'll leave it with you then, Jeff. Thank you very much, Bill. So our next speaker is Diane Wilson. Of all the speakers today, Diane is the one I've known the longest. We used to work bingos together back when she was a fencing parent in the mid 1990s. Diane's the only person I know who can talk about people who've been dead for 150 years as if she just came from coffee with them. Raised on a farm near Silton, Saskatchewan, she majored in anthropology and archaeology at the University of Saskatchewan's Regina campus, nowadays, of course, the University of Regina. Diane worked in archaeology in Saskatchewan and Manitoba in the 1970s, and she's been in Saskatoon since 1976. She's been on the Mar Residence Management Board, the Saskatoon Heritage Society Board, the Friends of the Forestry Farmhouse Board, and the Nutana Community Association Board. 
She does walking and driving tours of Nutana and the Broadway District, Caswell Hill, the Riversdale Business District, and downtown. Diane has also worked on the city's database of heritage properties, which I use almost every day, and she was responsible for the Nutana Community Association's Century Houses project in 2007. And her article is entitled, The Identification of the 1883 Charles Garrison House. Ladies and gentlemen, Diane Wilson. There we go. Hi. <laughs> I guess it will work. I don't, like Bill, I don't do technology very well. So my uh, article in the uh, current history review um, i'm entitling this little presentation an obsession and a picture and this research project started with an unabashed obsession with details of the early settlement in saskatoon and a small misfiled photograph in the saskatoon public library's local history room collections the mystery photo found in the uh, Silas Lake House file was identified as Main Street 438, the address of the well-known Silas Lake House. This was an obviously old photo. It depicts an old building in poor repair with its stucco exterior finish failing. And while superficially similar to the Silas Lake House, there are differences in the architectural details that indicate that this is a different structure. So the hunt was on for its true identity. Now, Archie Brown, one of the 1883 arrivals in the fledgling community, records the construction of the first seven buildings in his narrative in the publication Narratives of Saskatoon. And this is a collection of narratives uh, collected by Arthur Silver Morton and published in 1927 by the University of Saskatchewan Bookstore. So I'm going to read from Archie Brown's neg uh, narrative. Finally, some lumber came down the river in the fall of 83, brought down the river in two rafts from Rush Lake by a crew of Swedes. The Swedes put up what was called the company buildings, really a double storefront. They then left for Moose Jaw. R.W. Dalmage, Charles Garrison, and Silas Lake put up buildings, mere shells, but it entitled them to a free lot. George Grant, John Kahn, and towards spring, one for the company. So that's what Archie Brown has to say. The locations and visual representations of six of those seven buildings have been determined through previous research by myself and the late local historian, Donald Irvine. The location and a visual depiction of the building constructed by Charles Garrison, however, has remained somewhat elusive. And uh, so the question is, could this unknown building in this photograph be the missing Charles Garrison property. It looks old enough. It, um, it, it might be a contender. Archie Brown also adds a bit more information in his narrative. Uh, he says the Garrison building was sold to the Fletchers when they arrived as C. Garrison did not return from Ontario. And the Fletchers that Archie Brown is um, referring to would be Grace Fletcher and her husband, Joe. 
Um, Joe had come in 1884 and uh, established a homestead in what's now the Montgomery area. And Grace arrived in June of 1885 with three small children. And it appears that pretty soon after she arrived, um, they purchased the garrison building. And so using a variety of sources, including a September 1884 handwritten community newsletter, an 1885 drawing showing the Saskatoon community, an annotated hand-drawn from memory map illustrating Saskatoon before the railway came. So the railway came through in 1890. And this map was drawn in the 1960s by Grace Fletcher's eldest daughter, Maud, uh, who was about four when they came to Saskatoon. Um, more uh, sources include the 1907, 1911, and 1913 City of Saskatoon fire insurance plans. Thanks, Jeff. And uh, early tax assessment records, business directories, and Saskatoon Phoenix and Star Phoenix newspaper items, as well as published personal memories of local community life and events from those early years. Um, have contributed to a conclusion of the mystery. Now, I'm not going to go into the gory details. It would take all night, but uh, you can read the article to find out the conclusion. And I just want to say that this is not the end of research into early Saskatoon and Nutana. It's a rabbit warren with a great many more holes to just explore. So I will be back. Thank you. Well, thank you, Diane, and we look forward to having you back. So our final speaker is uh, me. Huh. And actually, I had expected to uh, to um, uh, introduce myself. So I've actually got my own biography here in front of me. But it's almost exactly like the one that Rowan did, except for at the very end in my version, I add that uh, Jeff married a nice Saskatoon girl and now has three children, five grandchildren, several cats, a dog, and a nice house in the suburbs. And if you talk to him long enough, he'll eventually try to get you to take one of his cats. And actually, I'm a little surprised that no cat has joined us on camera here tonight. So Jeff's article is Factoria, the Magic City, Saskatoon, and the Search for Industry. So let me tell you about it. In the fall of 2020, I was working on an article for Saskatoon Home Magazine about Factoria, which is a boom era industrial subdivision where the Silverwood Heights neighborhood is now. Now, Saskatoon Home, as you may know, is a home and lifestyle magazine, and it includes a regular feature on local history, which I write. And in fact, Saskatoon, Saskatoon Home got a uh, Heritage Award in 2020 for uh, education in the heritage field. Anyway, about the same time, fall, uh, summer, fall of 2020, I get a call from a teacher friend of mine at Marion Graham asking if I do a presentation on Factoria for one of the high for for one of her classes. So these articles that I write for Saskatoon Home, they're very short, right? They're about 1,200 to 1,400 words. Doesn't give you a lot of room to sort of dig into your subject. But I always start by writing a draft that's really has two or three times as much material as I can actually use, and then I cut it down to size. So between the two of these things, the Saskatoon Home article and the and the um, the walking tour of Factoria, I've got this huge pile of extra research and writing sitting around, and I'm thinking. Wouldn't this be a great article for Saskatoon history? So I'm going to read a little bit of it. But first of all, I want to give a shout out to Bonnie Dahl. Robert E. Glass was a Chicago entrepreneur, supposedly, who was the driving force behind Factoria. And Glass kind of wanders onto the pages of history in November of 1912, and then he wanders right back off again a few months later. He's a complete stranger, but no more. With Bonnie's invaluable assistance, I was able to turn up quite a bit about the mysterious Mr. Glass, which forms an appendix to my article. Okay, so it's November of 1912. Saskatoon is the fastest growing city in the British Empire. People are making fortunes here, buying and selling lands, like Bill talked about. And they're talking about 50,000 people living here by 1916, 100,000 people by 1921. But to get all those people to come here, to make good on the dream of 1912, we need industry. We need factories. So allow me to read. 
In November of 1912, when Saskatoon's boom was at its dizziest pinnacle yet, a stranger come riding into town. And his name was Robert E. Glass, and he come all the way from Chicago, he said, where he represented an eastern syndicate interested in building a brewery. And not just any brewery, no sir, the biggest, finest brewery in the West. It was going to be six stories high, worth half a million dollars, pumping out 100,000 barrels of beer annually to be sold all over Canada and the United States. And the reason he was going to build it here, he said, was because he had been informed that here, right here in Saskatoon, just north of the city at a place called Silver Springs, was the purest water in all of Western Canada. That's right, right here in River City. And if you think you've seen this movie before, hang on to your hat. Silver Springs was the farm of a horse trader named Billy Silverwood, and it was named for the springs of pure water that seeped out of the riverbank there. There was a little in the way of indoor plumbing in those days. People in Saskatoon frequently got their water from wells or sloughs or straight from the river, and every house had an outhouse out back. Even after the first municipal water works opened in 1907, wells and outhouses continued to be a fact of life in Saskatoon. And along with that came regular outbreaks of typhoid fever, most commonly a consequence of drinking contaminated water, such as you might get from taking drinking water from the river downstream of a sewage outfall, or when the runoff from your outhouse leaches into the groundwater, or a contaminated bucket gets dipped into a well. So the situation was ready-made for a guy like Silverwood. People were dying like flies from bad water, he said in a 1948 interview, explaining how he'd conceived the idea of bottling the water from the springs on his farm and selling it to hotels, restaurants, and offices. At its height, the Silverwood Springs Bottling Company was shipping 120,000 gallons of spring water a year out of its plant on the riverbank just below Edelman Drive. But by 1913, advances in public health and improvement to the city's water and sewer system saw the incidence of typhoid fever plummet. The writing was on the wall for Billy Silverwood's glass company, and so, uh, sorry, his bottling company, and so Glass's proposal must have seemed heaven sent. Now, somewhat of a problem for Glass, apparently, was that while he only wanted to buy Silverwood's riverbank property where the springs and the bottling works were, Silverwood also owned most of what constitutes modern day Silverwood Heights, and he insisted that Glass by that too. Now, fortunately for R.E. Glass, it turned out that Silverwood property wasn't merely blessed with endless supplies of pure spring water remarkable for its beautiful sparkling appearance. Oh no, it also happened to have inexhaustible deposits of clay, sand, and limestone. Glass reported that his experts had examined samples thereof and declared them ideal for brick making and the sand unmatched for the making of bottle glass, for which he said there was an immense Canadian market. My God, we're all going to get rich. And so Factoria was born, and the plan was simple. First, Glass needed to convince the railway to build a spur line through the property. You can't have factories without railways. Then he had to convince the city to run a power line out there because industries need electricity. But the first thing to do was to hire a survey crew to lay out streets and lanes and lots because once you have those, you can start running big ads every day in the newspaper about all the industries that are going to locate out there and all the workers they'll need and, and this is the important part, the fact that the workers are going to need a place to live. By today, the ads screamed, and by they did. Residential lots in Factoria were selling initially for $500 a piece. $500 was a lot of money in 1913, especially for a piece of bald prairie two miles past the last streetlight. But lots in Factoria, with a guarantee of pure sparkling Silverwood Springs water to be piped to every house, sold like bug spray at a nudist colony. By the end of January, some properties there were selling at up to three times their original price, and that boys and girls, is how you make money off an industrial subdivision with no industries in it, by getting speculators to buy residential properties in the hopes of reselling them later to the armies of factory workers who will come live there after the factories are built. Thank you very much. So that is the end of my part of this uh, evening, and I believe that's it for our speakers. And so I want to thank all of our speakers for your time and your efforts and your contributions to local history in Saskatoon. I have to tell you a personal story and it kind of sounds like it's about me, but it's not really. Somebody said to me one time, they said, boy, Jeff, you know a lot about Saskatoon. And, and okay, I've been a city archivist for 24 years, so maybe I do, but I'm going to tell you something. I, uh, all these other people did all this heavy lifting before I got here. People like Peggy Sargent and people like Bill Delaney and Diane Wilson and 
uh, people who have been writing about and thinking about uh, Saskatoon history and local history for decades. The, uh, the stack of books on Saskatoon history is this big and they go all the way back to 1928. And so there is an immense amount, immense wealth of detail available to all of us about our history here in Saskatoon and writers like Diane and Bonnie and Peggy and Ryan and, and Bill are adding to that every day. And so thank you to all of them and thank you to all of you. And now I believe we're going to have a question and answer session. And I have to tell you, I don't know exactly how that's going to work. Luckily, Rowan, our amazing facilitator, is going to take care of it. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um, so we are quite low on time. Um, we've got time for, for one or two questions, I think. So if you have a question, oh, I see someone has already popped one in the Q&A. Um, and I saw one here from Laura Foley wondering when the review is going to be on sale. And it is on sale now. It's available in store. Um, we are just about to close for the evening. But if you give us a call tomorrow morning, uh, we would be happy to put one on hold for you. Okay, so Samantha Cohen has several questions. Um, do you have maybe one question? <laughs> maybe we'll save that. We'll save that for a little bit later. Oh, here's a question for Jeff. Uh, can Jeff maybe let us know about the remnants at uh, Factoria? Absolutely. So, okay, uh, Factoria, um, Billy Silverwood's farm was at the, uh, the tail end, the foot end of Edelman Drive. And you can see uh, there are his, uh, his uh, back doorstep is uh, sitting there, uh, right there at the round around where you park. And then when you go down the trail, there is what's left of his barn. He had a huge horse barn, which caught fire about 1951 and burnt down. And so um, there's that uh, that's left over. And uh, kids have been partying out there for decades, right? You go down there now and there's broken beer bottles and stuff like that. But if you follow the trail farther down, you'll find the foundations of, uh, of the bottling factory, of the bottling works uh, down by the river. And, uh, and there you will find a large mound of melted glass, which is all that's left of uh, the bottles of water that he sold. And then farther down in amongst the trees, there's sort of bits of iron and, uh, and odd sort of pieces of metal kicking around that uh, are quite interesting. So it's worth a walk down on the trails just to see those things. Thank you so much, Jeff. Okay, we have a question for Ryan Walker, if he's still around. Um, Samantha Cohen asks, he mentioned grasslands are among the most endangered ecosystems in the world. And could he expand on that a bit if he's still around? Oh, I'll get myself off the screen here. One moment. Uh, yeah, I think I'm, I'm audible now. Um, yeah, what could I tell you um, in a minute, uh, except that uh, I, I think that, you know, it, it is, um, you know, very much a scarce um, natural landscape. And, and as I said, uh, the most endangered in the world. And I think part of the reason for that is that uh, it's underappreciated. And, um, and, and also it's, it's, um, it's fundamentally buildable. So, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, it tends to be land that, that can be prepared for development, uh, you know, uh, reasonably efficiently, but it's also uh, an ecosystem that doesn't necessarily, that people don't necessarily appreciate as being as remarkable as a forest or, or, um, or mountain landscape, just to name a couple of quick ones. Um, of course, there are many, many, uh, many landscapes within those. So, and in Saskatchewan, I think, you know, we're lucky to have um, some, you know, I mean, and especially here in Saskatoon to have the Northeast Swale and Small Swale within, within our city region, we're really lucky to have that. And it's fundamentally a part of our Saskatchewan identity. 
um, from uh, First Nations and Métis through to, through to settlers uh, to today. So I'm hopeful that we'll, we'll be able to uh, do a good job of preserving uh, Peggy McCurcher Conservation Area, but the, the small swale overall actually, which it's part, and of course the Northeast Swale. Thank you so much, Ryan. Um, so we are pretty much out of time here. Um, there's just one note here from Murray Scharf uh, mentioning that Grace Westminster Church is celebrating its 140th anniversary this year. Uh, and the church is named after Grace Fletcher. So thanks for that comment. Um, and once again, thank you so much to the Saskatoon History Review and especially uh, to all of the contributors who shared tonight and to our wonderful host, Jeff O'Brien. Um, you can purchase copies of the Saskatoon History Review number 31 in store. Um, like I mentioned, we are closed for the evening, but we'll be open tomorrow at 10 a.m. So feel free to give us a call and we can set one aside for you. Um, maybe I'll just invite everyone to turn their videos on briefly uh, to say goodbye for the evening and uh, and then we'll we'll end it on that note. Thanks so much for joining us everyone and take care. Bye everyone.